Well, listen, thank you very much for um, freeing up some time to speak to us. We're huge fans. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Top Gear's a cracking show, obviously. And I, I love the uh, Evil Knievel documentary. Oh, did you catch that? Yeah, I did. I was, as a kid, I guess like you as well, growing up, he was the first kind of... He was, to me, he was more of a superhero than, like, Spider-Man. Yeah. Like because you saw him on TV when uh, American stuff on our TV screens back in the sort of late 70s and 80s, you know, was people like Evil Knievel. And yeah. they were, like, really exciting and it was the coolest thing in the world, what Evil Knievel did. But I think as well, he was from a time, wasn't he, when if we saw somebody do something on the telly, they were doing it for real. He predates yeah. computer-generated stuff and all of that. So if we wanted to see somebody on a motorbike jumping over 13 buses and breaking his pelvis, somebody had to do it for real. And it was him. And also, didn't you get the feeling, when I was watching it, I was wondering if someone like Evil Knievel uh, came along these days and said, I'm going to jump over some buses at Wembley. Nobody would no, 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 yeah, Whatever. Bother. Whatever. Are you going to do it whilst on fire? No, well, I'm not bothered. Our, our standards were kind of lower then, weren't they? We were simpler. Yes, Back we then, we were, everything was made of wood or stone, <laughs> and we were happy. I tell you, I got a really mega goosebumps moment driving around his hometown Butte with him. I had to drive him. Man, that was scary. Um, I'm driving Evil Knievel. No stunts. See, he must have been a terrible backseat driver. Yes. You're in the wrong gear. You're yes. in the wrong gear. Oh, absolutely. I had no <laughs> compulsion about telling it. That's wrong. I'm sorry. What? Everything. But um, we were driving around the lanes where he grew up. And it was. I grew up in suburban Birmingham. So the, the streets were very much like the ones I grew up. I mean, the, the builders so you're saying there's a huge comparison between you and no, Evil Knievel? No, what I'm saying is he was, we were driving around with him and I said to him, Evil. And that takes some getting used to calling him. Evil, somebody. you can't evil. call him evil. No, that's what he is. That's what everybody calls him. <laughs> you can't call the guy evil. I know, it's really weird. So, evil, or do I call you Eve? No, evil, okay. Mr. Um, evil? Yeah, sir. And um, evil, when, when I was a kid, and when you were a kid, we used to ride around on our bicycles, you know, pretending they were motorbikes and pretending to be, well, you. So who did you pretend to be? And he told me about a guy called Joey Chitwood, who was some stunt bloke locally. And then I said, well, we used to tape a piece of cardboard to the chainstay of the bike so it went into the spokes and sounded like a motorbike and he used to do exactly the same oh that's fantastic man I was covered in goosebumps at that but the thought of Evil Knievel before Evil Knievel existed if you yeah. know, riding around on his bicycle pretending it was a motorbike doing wheelies oh, that was you see there's a link between us all. And well, you know, when I was watching the documentary, I got the feeling at times he was, he was, he was quite a kind of curmudgeonly old guy. There was that bit on the golf course when he was just, <laughs> he was just wasting your time, wasn't he? Yeah. It? Well, he was evil Knievel. He I mean, do he, that. he could. He, exactly right. He wasn't somebody. He was one of, he's one of those names where you can say, who do you think you are? Evil Knievel. <laughs> oh, you actually are. And, and so he was a legend in his own lifetime. He, he set out from a ghastly mining town in Montana, I mean, a really hard place. Yeah. There wasn't a lot on offer there. It's like a, uh, you know, your life story with Birmingham, wasn't it? Very, very similar. I set yeah. off from suburban Shirley yeah. <laughs> to Milton Keynes. <laughs> made and it. I'm, it's happening now. <laughs> and... Um, I know this is probably the question you get asked more than anything, uh, anything else after the accident. But, but how are you now? Are you complete? Because we read various bits of newspapers. You never know really what's just sort of newspaper speculation. But, you know, now you're in front of me. I'm desperate to ask you, how are you now, Richard? <laughs> I'm actually facing you when I say this as well. <laughs> no, you're, li you're lying down, <laughs> Talking bleeding. Talking to a plant in the corner. <laughs> yes. No, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fixed, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, I don't want to belittle acquired brain injury because it happens yes. to a lot of people and it's horrible yeah. and uh, I, I have been asked somebody asked me the, I was a mate actually um, we were in my garage cleaning a car sorry uh, I know well, couldn't you lie and say you I were know. shooting up or yeah, we were, know, we were having an orgy a rock and roll thing <laughs> I was cleaning my Morgan <laughs> that's the least rock and roll thing a human being can possibly do no I think that is the most rock and roll thing I was cleaning my Morgan and he said to me Rich given all that's happened since you know would, would you do it again would you have the crash again no I mean I, that, that, that's no it was a horrible horrible experience brain damage of whatever level to whatever so degree is awful. But lucky I'm, I'm to lucky to be I'm, alive, aren't you? I'm told all the time how lucky I am. Yeah. Yes, I would have been quite a lot luckier if a tyre hadn't blown at 290 mile an hour. That was, you're right, that was a bit of bad luck there, <laughs> oh, in fairness. At the time, when it went, and I thought, and now I die, at no point did I think, that was lucky! That thought never crossed my mind. And so how is it when you first got behind any car after the accident and sort of your recovery and rehabilitation and stuff like that? Did You you must have been nervous. Just get behind like, no, any car. No, because... And the doctors are very worried about flashbacks. And yeah. that can be an issue when it's, yeah. it's, it's brain damage, brain injury. After this is such you, you a huge have, trauma. Yeah, but if you think, people sustain the same sort of injury I did falling off a bike. And so the first time you get back on a bicycle, that's going to be really hard. Yeah. But the first time I got back in a car, 
it was different. Because what was it? Was I, it a trip to the shops? What was the yeah, first it was, trip? Yeah, I, I, I just arranged to go out for a little drive in the car, and I got my license back because they, they take it away until they make sure. What, are right. you made to redo the test? Or no, I wasn't because they didn't drill my skull. Um, they didn't have to, but you, know, some people. So do. if they trefan people, then they will make them yeah. redo the test. That's if, fair enough. If they have to open, I think it's fair. <laughs> yeah, enough. just make sure it's all screwed back on. Yeah. No, but it, it was. Um, was anyone with you or? Yeah, my wife, Minnie. Yeah. Just to make sure, but I, th- I think because when I had me crash, the last thing I saw was, you know, fleet of paramedic ambulances ready, and then a, a runway, and then I heard a jet engine start, and I unleashed a car with the power of thirteen Formula One cars. That's not like going out of me old Morgan. It's not. <laughs> it's not like whereas people who did it falling off a bicycle going to the shops, yeah, or driving an ordinary car to go to the shops. The next time they get in an ordinary car, I can see how that would be hard for me. I wasn't strapping myself to a jet. Again, it's rubbish. I wouldn't advise it. And what about then when you've got to think about getting back into doing Top Gear? You know, a huge show and sort of in your career, you're, sort of, you know, you're making it after all the hard work and stuff like that. You know, what did the conversation happen, with, uh, discussion happen with uh, you and your wife about getting back into driving really fastly again? She knew I had the support of my colleagues. Oh, yeah. I remember watching that episode when you came back and Clarkson yeah. just said, are you a bit mental? I don't remember that show at really? all. Really? No, I don't remember doing it. I really don't. But uh, Mindy, my wife, has always she understands that, that we, we look at the risks and we consider what they are and what I'm going to do and if it's worth it and what can we do to mitigate against it going wrong and if it does go wrong, will I be all right? And just as we did with the jet car. Yeah. We took it very seriously, so we'd check structurally the car itself would sustain and, and withstand a crash. And we'd check the harnesses were the best, the crash helmet was the best, and every single one of those things saved my life. So we'd always, that's how we operate. Yeah. And it was there a tremendous a bit of guilt as well amongst the other sort of, you know, James May and, and Clarkson? Because if I read this right, was one of the other boys supposed to be doing that? It's always been mooted, that. I don't yeah. know. Because the, the official line is, well, they're too tall. Because their heads would have stuck out the top. <laughs> so <laughs> it would Clarkson have, would have likely squeezed into a dodger or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it would have been quite messy. No, we all do jobs come yeah. along and we do them. Um, I... It was actually... It was my idea. Um, and so I take it on the chin entirely. I did rush into the office. I wrote about that exact moment because I remember it very clearly when I went into the office and the, the boss, a guy called Andy Wilman, who is a genius, mm. he sets the tone of the show. So is this guy, he's the big sort of producer? Yeah, he, yeah. he oversees it. He's, he's Jeremy's best mate, they go back years, but he's, they, they cooked up the idea of the show and Andy Wilman is, is responsible largely for setting the tone and reining us three idiots in and dealing with the complaints. He's busy. <laughs> Oh, just yeah. say, 24-hour job. Oh, yeah. But I went into the office and said to him one morning, just, Andy, Andy, I've got a brilliant idea. I want to go really, really fast. Well, what, what do you want to do? Just really fast. That was it. That was as fast. But it wasn't a sophisticated idea. Some shows, they'll go and, you know, maybe a new idea for a ballet they'll pitch or some complicated reality show. I just said, I want to go really fast. And the idea floated around, and then eventually we found this car that I could drive, and we thought, well, perfect. Let's see. 